questions at the end are most welcome but also if during the in the course of uh, this lecture if anybody has anything to clarify please feel free to just uh, interrupt button and ask um otherwise it's always most convenient if you note down and ask your questions at the end so questions are most welcome please don't feel intimidated by the topic so what is the role of nuclear medicine in nephrology so just a little bit of background um i hope i'm audible if anybody is having any problems listening please let me know and uh, i would also request you i think uh, the arrangements have already made that there is no noisy interruptions like somebody keeping their uh, mics unmuted okay so what is the difference between radiotherapy and nuclear medicine sometimes this whole idea of radio isotope anything connected with radiation is connected to radiotherapy or radio diagnosis so some essential differences just an outline of this radiotherapy uses sealed sources like cobalt 60 or radium cesium for teratherapy and brachytherapy in nuclear medicine we used unsealed sources so what's the difference the sealed sources come sealed in a shielding material in nuclear medicine the unsealed isotopes come in solid liquid or gaseous form they are administered to the patient which means you are putting the radioactive isotope inside the patient's body for diagnosis or therapy or for research so we use different types of isotopes that is alpha emitters beta emitters and gamma emitters alpha emitters and beta emitters are used for therapy some examples being actinium 225 as an alpha emitter iodine 131 as a beta emitter the gamma emitters are the ones used for diagnosis so for this purpose of this lecture let's we'll keep ourselves restricted to the gamma emitters because we're not talking about any therapy here so the next thing is the uh, nuclear medicine tripod now here we have three people involved in any investigation the physician that's me the medical physicist who looks after the instrumentation and the radiation dosimetry how much of radiation is being given to the patient the radio pharmacist who prepares the radio pharmaceutical the radio pharmaceutical is what we are talking about here you have a radio nuclide that's the isotope part of it which is attached to a chemical to form the radio pharmaceutical which is then injected into the patient so that was uh, between radiotherapy and nuclear medicine now between radiology and nuclear medicine and radiology when you're using radiation like in x ray and ct the radiation source is on one side the patient is in front the radiation passes through the patient so you get uh, the imaging instrument catching these radiations to form a transmission image which is in most cases an anatomical image which gives a significantly higher radiation dose usually than nuclear medicine we are not talking about ultrasound or mri here and when you are talking nuclear medicine since as i told you the isotope is administered into the patient's body the radiation is coming out of the patient's body and is caught on an imaging instrument so what you have here is an emission image which in most cases is a functional image and the radiation dose is considerably less so coming to renal scintigraphy that, that was the background on how these uh, tracers and how the imaging system is that's the basic uh, principle so renal radio tracers now you have two types one is dynamic tracers one is static tracers i'll just illustrate what i mean by both of these for the moment just take the names the dynamic radio tracers include technetium 99m dtpa technetium 99m ec tc 99m mag3 and iodine 123 ortho iodo hepurate or oih the full names are given here you can look them up at your leisure the static images are found by technetium 99m dmsa and gha so we'll just go through these one by one so in, you'll notice that in most of these excepting for oih in most of these the radioactive isotope part is technetium 99m the pharmaceutical part of it keeps changing and i'll just uh, explain in detail what each one of these does and how they help in nephrology diagnosis so the classification uh, if i use the analogy of a triple rider cycle the different parts of the nephron are uh, used by these tracers so if you look at glomerular tracers these include technetium 99m dtpa 
chromium 51 EDTA, I-125 iothalamate. Of these, it's only the DTPA part of it which is used in imaging. Chromium 51 EDTA we used to use for determination of GFR earlier. So did we with iotin 131 iothalamate, but these are no longer in common use. The tubular agents, that is those that are secreted by the renal tubules include MAG3 and DC and I-123 OIH. And the cortical agents are GHA and DMSA. So how do these work? Now, when the clearance is less than the GFR, you have net reabsorption. So these include substances like glucose and urea. And clearance is equal to GFR, you have no net reabsorption. So that works as inulin and DTPA, which is why these two are the most ideal agents for determination of GFR. When the clearance, the tubular clearance is more than the GFR, you have net secretion. So that works with tubular agents. So the working, the mechanism of urine formation, you're all in nephrology, you would know, I don't want to waste time on this. The afferent arterial comes in, the efferent artery goes out. There's glomerular filtration through the capsule. And then there is a fluid uh, in the renal tubule, which is either secreted or reabsorbed to form the urine, right? So how does it help in our imaging? Now you have, let's compare the glomerular agents and the tubular agents. The glomerular agents, as I said, can measure GFR. So both blood flow as well as former GFR uh, estimation. You can do it with blood sample analysis or just on the imaging, I'll demonstrate how. The extraction fraction of the glomerular agents is much lower. One thing to remember that the estimation of differential renal function may be inaccurate in early infancy when the renal uh, glomerular, the renal uh, nephrons are not very mature at that stage. The tubular agents cannot measure GFR directly, but they have a much higher extraction. And even in the first week of life, you can estimate the differential renal function. Now, remember the infant kidney is immature. When we are talking about renal imaging, there'll be one set of rules for the infants and very small children and another set of rules for the adult patients. And I'll show you how it works. So please remember that renal uptake of these radio traces is particularly low in infants with a very high radio act, uh, background activity. So preference has to be given to traces with a high extraction like Hepuran, MAG3 or Technetium EC. Technetium EC is the one we generally use in our regular practice now. So between these uh, agents, if you look at the iodinated hepurans and the MAG3, so I-123 and I-131 OIH, they're cl cleared primarily by organic anion transporter one. It's a small component that is filtered by the glomeruli, but, and these have a very high extraction fraction. Unfortunately, I-123 is a cyclotron product, which is not available in this country. It has a short half-life of 13 hours. So it's not really available to us for use. And I-131 has very poor imaging characteristics with a high radiation dose. So this is not a very good choice either. So which is why the OIH agents are not really used in routine practice in this country. The, uh, wherever I-123 is available, you'll have OIH scans being done. So now coming to the second agent that is Technetia MAG3. This is also a tubular agent, which is highly pro uh, protein bound. The extraction fraction is very high. It's more than twice that of technetium DTPA, which is why it is preferred over DTPA in patients where there is impaired renal function. A small fraction of the IV injected tracer is also excreted by the hepatobiliary system, which is why once in a while you will find there's a small visualization of gallbladder or small bowel in the delayed images. This is a normal physiological finding. The tracer which is most commonly used in India today is technetium 99M, LL and DD ethylcysteine, diacysteine, that is EC. The DD isomer is not, uh, is although it has a more rapid clearance, but it is the LL is, uh, isomer which was, first, uh, which was first described. And this is what the technetium 99M LL EC is what we use routinely in our practice. So to summarize, if you compare OIH, MAC3 and LL EC, the extraction efficiency is highest with OIH, but it has the drawbacks, which I told you. The glomerular filtration between these is again highest for OIH. The plasma protein binding is highest for MAG3. And uh, these are some other uh, parameters which you can read up more about. The clearance is maximum for OIH, but as I said, we can't routinely use it. So 
Let's compare the other two, MAC3 and EC. As you can see, the EC clearance is higher than that of MAC3. So that's a basic advantage that we have. The other being that MAC3 is not manufactured in the country. It has to be imported. So the cost is very high. One vial of Technetia MAC3 on which you can do maybe 10, 15 patients will cost you around 6,000 rupees. But one vial of EC costs less than 1,000 rupees because it is provided by our own uh, BRC agency that is BRIT. So that is another reason why we all prefer. It's cheaper, it's available in the country, and it has a much higher extraction fraction in the kidneys. Briefly on the cortical agents, nobody uses GHA anymore. Uh, I mean, very few people use GHA, namely it is DMSA that is of use. So technetium DS DMSA is filtered, it's bound to the alpha-1 microglobulin, and it accumulates in the kidney cortex with the megalin mediated endocytosis. So there is parenchymal retention of this tracer. Uh, neither of these, GHA or DMSA, is used for diuretic renography for obstructive purposes. This is used for cortical evaluation, and I'll give you the whole list of how it is useful. About 90% circulates in the blood. The kidney extraction is 5% at each passage, and about 50% of the administered activity is retained in the proximal convoluted tubule cells, mainly in the cytoplasm. The maximum Cortical uptake occurs at three hours, so we image at three hours after injection. So now coming to diuretic renography, the first of the uses. The clinical applications, whether you're using technetium DTP or whether you're using technetium EC, are the same. Estimation of relative renal function, obstructive uropathy to evaluate drainage, calculation of GFR using DTPA, ERPF using EC, renovascular hypertension or RAS, location of small ectopic kidneys and evaluation of renal transplants. These cover most of the uses. There are a few others uh, which I'll show which are usually anecdotal uses. So first the patient preparation. Now, unlike the radiological investigations, there is very little preparation required for the radio tracer urography. What is essential, there are only two essential uh, components. One is hydration. You have to ensure adequate hydration because in most of these studies, we will be using a diuretic like furosemide. So to, uh, this, if you hydrate the patient well, it prevents dehydration, particularly in young inf children and infants. Uh, the other is you get a better evaluation of the kidney. If the patient cannot take oral intake, then IV hydration is can be used in the form of dextrose and water. And the idea is maximization of urine output and not volume replacement. No special diet is required. In fact, we encourage the patient to have a normal breakfast before the study or normal meals, because if the patient comes in fasting, we have seen this happen. The patient thinks that fasting is required in spite of instructions, and they don't even take water, and the patient ends up dehydrated. The only essential uh, feature which you must ensure is that if IV contrast has been used in the immediate past, as in an IVP or a contrast enhanced CT, then scintigraphy should be delayed by one to two weeks. Usually the rule that we follow is seven to 10 days after an IVP and about two weeks after the CCT. In an emergency, you can even do it within a week after the study, but ensure that the patient has been hydrated well during that time because the radiological contrasts cause a kind of nephropathy, which may not be obvious from biochemical tests, but it will definitely affect the quality of the scan when you're doing a scintigraphy. Bladder catheterization. Now this is uh, on a case-to-case -case basis. If the patient can void by themselves, then all that is required is that the patient empties the bladder before acquisition of the dynamic images or the actual image. Because a full bladder can cause increased intravesical pleasure with uh, delayed drainage from the renal pelvis. In small children if who are not toilet trained, a full bladder can cause discomfort. The patient starts squirming around and wriggling on the table. This causes uh, movement artifacts in the images. You might even have to stop the study prematurely. So in such cases, uh, catheterization may be required. Also, Continuous drainage of the radioactive urine from the bladder reduces the gonadal radiation dose from whatever little tracer is reaching there. 
bladder catheterization is essential in patients where you have a documented vu reflux in advance if there is a bladder outlet obstruction if there is a neurogenic bladder which again may also be accompanied by reflux in case of ectopic kidneys where there is a low lying small kidney in close proximity to the bladder you need the bladder to be totally empty throughout the study if you are going to identify the kidney separately from the bladder the kidney region of interest is something we draw when evaluating the renal function and if it overlaps with the bladder region then you are going to have problems in separating the two and in patients with significant post void residual urine so in such cases it is good to have the bladder catheterized in advance so you have a well hydrated patient who has put supine on the table sedation is only required in extremely uncooperative uh, children any child over the age of 3 to 4 years usually you can talk to them convince them or use very mild sedation if required but properly prepared the patients are usually cooperative once they know that there is only one iv injection to be given initially there might be a bit of resistance but after the single iv injection then it's just the patient has to lie there for about 25 minutes if the patient is not cooperative then sedation might be required usually we use oral sedation only so for normal kidneys normally positioned kidneys that is uh, usually you have an ultrasound report which tells you what the kidney position is only a posterior view is required now please remember this is important in renal scintigraphy the gamma camera is positioned in the posterior view that is behind the patient is supine and the camera is under the patient so when we look at a scan left is left right is right unlike in an ivp where usually you're looking anteriorly so left is right and right is left so here you are looking at the posterior projection so uh, the side must be very carefully determined in transplant kidneys we take an anterior view because here the kidney is positioned anteriorly uh, when you have say ectopic kidneys horseshoe kidneys or any kind of renal uh, uh, conjoint kidneys cross fused ectopia it's good to have a dual detector so you get both anterior and posterior projections it's not involving any additional radiation you are injecting the same amount of activity but if you have both the anterior and the posterior projections you can make out uh, both the kidneys or the ectopic kidney function much better the tracer injected is usually in a dose of 1 to 5 millicuries depending on the size of the patient we acquire immediate dynamic images for 25 minutes followed by delayed static images up to 5 or sometimes even up to 24 hours but up to 3 hours is essential in most cases so to calculate the dose of the administered activity um for adult dose it's usually 4 millicuries of ec or dtp or dmsa 4 to 5 millicuries in transplant kidneys you use double the dose because you want a better uh, perfusion assessment so perfusion images are usually 2 seconds per frame you need a better higher dose to get a good quality image during those 2 seconds i'll show you the images so to make it clearer pediatric doses are usually calculated by the webster rule that is h plus 1 by h plus 7 into the adult dose or you can use the european association of nuclear medicine dosage card as shown here so that part is for the nuclear medicine uh, staff to follow the use of furosemide as a diuretic so usually 0.5 mg per kg intravenously is given up to a maximum of 40 mg but this can be increased in case of a compromised renal function the dose is administered either 15 minutes before the study at the start of the study or 15 minutes after the start of the study depending on requirement now just a little bit of uh, a couple of minutes on this the usual protocol followed for an adult patient is either t plus 15 or t plus 10 that is you start the study uh, by with the intravenous injection of the radio tracer watch the kidneys for the first 10 minutes now if the kidneys are draining out by themselves without any problems there is no need to administer a diuretic if there is a hold up you can actually watch the study while it is going on on the monitor if it looks like one or both of the kidneys is having a problem there is hold up in the pelvic collegial system usually the drainage will start within 3 to 4 minutes with technetium ec or with ddpa so if you think there is a hold up then at 10 minutes we give the iv furosemide and watch the and then continue the study for the remaining 15 minutes of the study the total study being of 25 minutes now what happens is in a child if you attempt the same thing then at the 10 minute uh, time interval 
when you inject the furosemide that second iv injection the child is likely to start squirming around and moving which will cause movement artifacts and ruin your study so what we do in children is we usually administer a t0 furosemide that is the furosemide is mixed with the radio tracer in the same syringe and administered as a bolus the t minus 15 is used in special cases where a previous renograph a uh, diuretic renography has been performed the results are equivocal um you have what is described in the report as a query partial obstruction or clearance is uh, equivocal uh, no definite ob- comment can be made about obstruction because there is a slow drainage which is neither obstructed nor non obstructed in pattern so to clear up these doubts what we do is we inject furosemide 15 minutes before starting the study the patient wipes immediately before lying down on the table and is well hydrated it's very important to maintain hydration when you're giving furosemide and 15 minutes after the furosemide you administer the radio tracer on the table and do the 25 minute study as usual the idea here is to conduct the study under peak diuresis conditions at 15 minutes the furosemide is a peak action so in effect you're pulling the flush on the kidneys the the tracer is now coming in with with the entire bolus the kidney is at its maximum diuresis stress so this usually is adequate to clear up any doubts as to whether there is an equivocal drainage or not so uh, let's look at a few examples now this is firstly a normal technetium ec scan um the left panel this gives the images the right panel gives a lot of facts and figures now this says mag clearance this is because uh, we don't have a separate ec protocol these protocols are designed by the manufacturers in the west where they don't use ec they use mag 3 but the protocol works very well with technetium ec as well so we use this to determine the different quantifiable quantifiable parameters now all these parameters are not necessarily used routinely so let's go through the images one by one i'll just spend a little time on this because this is the first scan and the same uh, parameters will be in all the subsequent images where you can just follow the images okay this first panel is of the perfusion phase so these are 2 second per frame images which have been reformatted this whole thing is of 1 minute so you have uh 24 frames 24 frames over 1 minute so roughly a little over 2 seconds per frame so this gives you the perfusion phase as you can see the bolus coming in through the abdominal aorta and the kidneys getting perfused remember these are posterior images so left kidneys on the left right kidneys on the right this graph now what happens is we draw a region of interest on the kidneys on the computer generated image the computer gives us a fusion image this is 0 to 30 seconds these images are fused into a single image so you can draw the region of interest over this over the left kidney and over the right kidney and over the abdominal aorta and then you get this graph for 60 seconds so this shows an excellent perfusion curve in both the kidneys which is then maintained the next part of the sorry the next part of the study is the dynamic phase for 24 minutes the first 1 minute is here the remaining 24 minutes in the bottom so again the region of interest drawn over the two kidneys the background roi is this is to uh, subtract any soft tissue component anterior and posterior to the kidneys themselves so you get pure kidney counts and from what you can see the two kidneys showing good cortical uptake by the third minute you see tracer in the renal pelvis and coming out into the bladder this is a normally functioning kidney so even without a diuretic you have very fast clearance as you can see the by 10 minutes most of the tracer has drained out into the bladder the remaining part of the study is just a continuation of the same and this when you translate into a graph by drawing these regions of interest now what you have here is the radioactive counts in the left kidney in the right kidney shown in the form of a graph as you can see this is called a time activity curve so the time activity curve is what is the renogram in earlier times when we didn't have imaging so only two probes would be put behind the kidneys and all you would have is this uh 
curve showing the radioactive counts rising and falling in each kidney. There were no images formed. Now we have the images and we also have the renogram curve. So if you can see both curves are practically symmetrical one on top of the other. And you see the rising part a little more about the curve later. So this is the normal renogram curve. And here you have all the parameters, the perfusion index, the thing, the time to peak, the time to half peak. So uh, the percentage function will be given by this uptake value. So uptake value is 50.5 on the left and 49.5 on the right. So roughly 50, 50 on each side. Up to 45, 55 is normal, depending on the size of the kidney. You can have a small kidney with absolutely normal function, in which case, because of the smaller size, this might give you a value of 40% on one side and 60% on the other side. Doesn't mean that the kidney is poorly functioning. It just means that that kidney is smaller. So it has taken up less counts, less tracer going in. So this, these are reported as uh, kidney function appropriate for size, right? The time to peak and the clearance TF. Now usually two to three minutes is the normal time to peak. It's 2.66 on each side. This is, as you can see, between two to three minutes it's peaked. Peak to half peak is the clearance T half. So it's four minutes on both sides. This should be below 10 minutes. Normal clearance T half is less than 10 minutes. Above 20 minutes of clearance T half is definitely obstructed. Between 10 and 20 minutes is a gray zone. So there we need the delayed images to see whether the kidney is like here. You can see by the uh, end of the dynamic study itself, both the kidneys are cleared. But if there is residual tracer retained in the renal pelvis renal uh, system, then you need further delayed images to see whether it's going to drain out sooner or later. Now the renogram curve, this is the normal renal time activity curve. So initially you have a vascular phase, then you have a concentration phase and then an excretion phase. So clearance you have eight to 12 minutes, as I said, below 10 minutes is normal. There are different curve patterns. And uh, this is, I think what all uh, the uh, clinicians, the nephrologists and urologists get very excited with this renogram curve. We are always asked, where is the renogram curve? Show us the renogram curve. Uh, I'm going through the renogram curves one by one, and then I'll tell you the pitfalls of these. Now, the left and the right are essentially the same. This is more colorful on the left side. It's in black and white on the right side. So grade zero or a normal curve. This is the normal curve, which you've just seen in the scan that I've shown you, the green curve here. Sharp rise, sharp fall. Obstructive pattern of B, which is, uh, which one is it here? It's uh, grade two, the red curve. So rise and then a flattening curve. Rise, flattening curve, it may be absolutely flat. It may be uprising. It may show a slight downward trend, but it doesn't come down. So this is an obstructive pattern. That is the grade two or the type two pattern. The grade one, which is the blue curve here on the left side, which is the dilated but unobstructed. So versus partial obstruction. Now D here is a partial obstruction. It rises, it flattens out, it comes, starts coming down, but it's not come down as it has in A. It has not remained plateau formation as in B. It's somewhere in between A and B. So this is a partial obstructive pattern. What you see here is a, the blue curve here is a dilated unobstructed. Here it has come down not as fast as the green curve. It doesn't stay up as much as the obstructive curve. It doesn't show the same, it's a steeper curve. So this format of partial obstruction versus dilated unobstructed is a tricky situation. It needs a lot of experience to uh, diagnose this condition. Grade three is a persistent nephrogram with no excretion. Okay, this has gone up, but as you can see, there is no peak, it's shifted to the right. So here there is a failure in the renal function. There is a depressed renal function. And because of which this will just continue to accumulate. You just have to take four more delayed images to see what happens eventually. The nephrons have not yet accumulated enough tracer to show a clearance pattern essentially. So now if you compare C and D, just to clear up that other part, the dilated unobstructed will show an increase, a plateau, and then a fall. Fall meaning it will almost simulate the type A pattern. 
a partial obstruction will not come down all the way. It would be hanging around somewhere in between. Finally, the type five, that is type four and five, renal failure with measurable renal function, renal failure with no renal function. What you can see is here, the curve is gradually getting flattened. So the worse the function, the lower the curve, and then finally you end up with a flat line. So flat line in any kind of uh, medical scenario is bad. Flat line EEG, flat line ECG, similarly flat line renogram curve is bad renal function. So let's look at what the pictures look like. Obstructive hydronephrosis. Now here, the left kidney is absolutely normal. Remember left is left, right is right. So left kidney, good cortical function, thick cortex, starts to clear out by the third minute, fourth minute you can see the bladder, and then uh, by about eight or nine minutes, the kidney is cleared out, nothing left. Right kidney, now this is a classical hydronephrotic kidney. You have a thinned out cortex, photopenic area corresponding to the pelvic alicial system. As the study progresses, there is slow accumulation of tracer or transmission of tracer from the cortex into the renal pelvis. By the end of the study, you don't see any ureteric activity and the tracer is still accumulating. This is the pre void or the, it's basically the same as the last image here. We take a static image here. Then the patient goes out and voids. Now out here, the other kidney is functioning. So the bladder has filled up. So the patient goes and voids. And once the patient comes back, this is the empty bladder five minutes later. This kidney still shows holdup of tracer. And at three hours, there is continued holdup of tracer. So here you have a hydronephrosis normal in size with fairly preserved function. It's mildly impaired, I would say. It's not normal. It's not a totally gone case kidney and continuous accumulation. So PUJ obstruction. This is what the renogram curves look like. The left kidney that is a red curve shows a normal renogram curve. The green curve, which is the green ROI for the right kidney shows a slow gradual, the type two obstructive curve pattern. It goes up and stays up. Right, And even in the perfusion phase, you can see that the cortex is thin and it shows reduced perfusion. This is typically reported as a hydronephrotic kidney with impaired perfusion and cortical tracer uptake, prolonged holdup and obstructed drainage. If you look at the function, it's 61.5 on the left and 38.5 on the right. So mildly impaired cortical function. As compared to hydronephrosis, now in this kidney, you will notice that on the right side, there is a photopenic defect. But this is not on the medial side corresponding to the pelvic alicial system, it's on the lateral cortex. It doesn't fill up with tracer, the kidney is functioning fine, it's draining out at the end of the study. I'm only focusing on the right kidney here. So even up to the delayed images at three hours, you continue to see this photopenic defect. It's not changed in shape, it's not changed in size, it's not picked up any tracer. This is a renal cyst or any kind of a renal space occupying lesion. It could be a renal tumor, it could be a hematoma, it could be a cyst. What is important, it is not connected to the collecting system. It is not participating in the renal function in any way. It's just a, a SOL, which is not connected to the renal system. Now, what happens in extreme cases of hydronephrosis? Now, here again, you have a normal left kidney, good cortical function, rapid drainage, left kidney is out of it, normal, let's leave it alone. The right kidney, now initially you see a huge kidney outline out here, picking up very little tracer, grossly hydronephrotic. As the study goes on, during the dynamic study, it starts picking up a little bit of tracer. pre you see this big sac with bladder filled up from the other kidney. After emptying out of the bladder, it shows up even more. Now, please remember between the pre word and post word, there's not much of a time gap. All that has happened is the bladder is emptied out. Now, this software has a problem that it normalizes the kidney, uh, normalizes the frame to the highest counts. So because there is a color scale, the darker the color, the higher the counts. So in the first frame, the bladder is full. So maximum this black and the dark color is in the maximum count region, that's the bladder. The moment the bladder empties out, now you get the real picture. This is the amount of tracer that is actually accumulated in this kidney. And it remains the same up to three hours. So grossly hydronephrotic kidney with a high grade PUG obstruction and quite a severely impaired cortical function. 
a little different from the obstructive pattern just a second yeah so here what you have is a duplex system now this is another very uh, region where the tunnel scintigraphy can be quite useful the duplex kidney is usually identified either on your ultrasound or on a ct scan or on your mr urography they have much better anatomical resolution to identify a duplex kidney on a renal scintigraphy you need to have a temporal difference between the two moieties now as you can see here the left kidney is again normal a uh, normal function normal drainage it's draining out quite well we leave the left kidney out of the discussion the right kidney now here you see initially there is uptake only in the inferior part of the kidney now as you go along say about 5 minutes into the study you start seeing some tracer activity in the upper part as you progress the lower part is seen to drain off the amount of activity in the first 4 minutes you can see it's draining off towards the end the upper part of the kidney is not very good function it slowly accumulates a little bit of tracer by the end so this kind of a temporal difference between the lower and the upper is what you see in a duplex system now how does the renal scintigraphy help you one is you process it in the normal way renogram curves because there is not much uh, uptake in the upper part so left and the right kidney uh, curves left renogram curve is the red one the right curve is the green one so percentage function put 65 35 the left and the right moieties you can also do a differential calculation between the upper and the lower moieties now just use the left roi the region of interest you use it on the upper moiety so now what you have here is the green one is the lower moiety the red one is the upper moiety now here as you can see this is the type 5 curve a flat curve not very good function i'm practically negligible function on the upper moiety the differential function being uh the upper moiety it will still show you left right because we can't change the software here so the red being the upper moiety is for 28% the right is the uh, green one that is the lower moiety is 72% so the upper moiety is contributing about 30% to the right kidney so of the total renal function since the left one was 60 with the right is in any case contributing about 35% so 30% of 35% um, i don't know how I, my maths is not very good but that would translate to about 10% of the total renal function so you can actually quantify the different parts of a duplex system this parameter is generally used when you're contemplating a nephrectomy of a particular moiety removal of a moiety if it's not functioning or if it is functioning below 10% then it is likely to be removed because this would act as if it's a hydronephrotic sac it would eventually end up working as an idus for infection and all kinds of problems for the patient if it is maintaining a good function you can consider repairing it and keeping it in place if it is showing a poor function as in this case 10% hardly 10% function removing it is not going to affect the overall renal function if quantified that the left kidney is doing most of the job the lower moiety of the right kidney is doing the remaining part of the job the upper moiety on the right side can be removed without significantly damaging the renal function overall okay so drawing the roi also has its pitfalls a whole kidney roi is what we generally go for excepting in cases where you can have a grossly enlarged like in the previous uh, patient you saw a grossly enlarged hydronephrotic right kidney here it's a hydronephrotic left kidney so let's see how this roi affects your kidney function calculation if you draw a whole kidney roi that's including the pcs and the cortex on both sides the split function is 45% on the left and 55% on the right and this is how the renogram curve looks like if you draw only the cortex now remember this is a hydronephrotic kidney it will gradually accumulate tracer in the renal pelvis which is not actually a functioning part it is the cortex which is going to pick up the tracer so if you draw cortical roi on both sides now the function is 35% on the left and 65 on the right and see the change in the renogram curve this is the previous one this is the present one the importance of this is that if you draw a whole kidney roi it can grossly overestimate the function here it is giving you 45% function whereas the actual function is only 35% what will happen is 
if you give a 45% function as shown by this, the surgeon operates, they deflate the kidney, the kidney shrinks in size, all this goes off. Subsequently, what you will get in the next time you draw whole kidney ROAs, you will get 35%. Now the patient will be up in arms that my kidney function was 45% before you operated, now it's 35%. So your surgery is actually brought down the kidney function. So this is why even if you draw a whole kidney ROI, the impression we give is it's likely overestimated. This 45% is an overestimated percentage. It's a fallacy in the software. We can't do anything about it. Best you can do is draw a cortical ROI to get a more realistic percentage function. So especially just to illustrate the same again, in a grossly hydronephrotic kidney, like in the previous, uh, that patient, this is now what we have done whole kidney ROI, you will get something like 39% uh, function on the right side. This kidney is hardly functioning at 20% capacity. So again, you say 40% on this, once they deflate, operate and deflate, this will come down to 20, 25% function. So it is better that it's even difficult to draw a cortical ROI here, looking at the poor function. So it's better to just mention that whatever percentage function you're calculating is an overestimation. So follow-up of kidney function. Now, this is what we are most commonly called upon to do in neoplasma medicine. This is a patient with a normal, normally functioning unobstructed left kidney and a hydronephrotic obstructed right kidney. September 2019, this is the first scan. So hydronephrotic kidney, now all of you should be easily able to identify hydronephrotic, slow uptake, hold up till three hours, obstructed hydronephrotic. That's the renogram curve. Percentage function 55 on the left side, 45 on the right side. January 2024, months later. How many of you can notice this decrease in function? Now you can see that the kidney is turning into a ghost. There is significantly reduced uptake. And now it's barely crossing the cortex. The function is reduced. You're not even seeing that accumulation. The denogram curve has dropped. The percentage function is 75 on the left and 25 on the right from the previous 55, 45. It's come down to 75, 25 now. Subsequent scan without any intervention, June 2020, five months later, kidneys disappeared. All function has been knocked off. You can barely see the kidney up to three hours. Flat line renogram curve, 95% on the left, 5%, less than 5% on the right. So if you Look at all three together. You see the right kidney, which is fairly okay. 45% was repairable function. No intervention done. Uh, I don't know why. Maybe the patient didn't turn up. Maybe they didn't get a date or they didn't want to be operated. But as you can see, between September 2019, January 2020, and June 2020, the right kidney has disappeared. It's destroyed by the obstructive pattern. And you can follow it up elegantly using the renogram curves and the renal cortical scintigraphy. So for estimation of GFR, that's the next thing that we do with uh, nuclear medicine. The ideal tracer, there's a long list of requirements, low molecular weight, no entry into intracellular space, no protein binding, no cellular metabolism, no interference with the renal function, no tubular secretion. It should be purely glomerular filtered uh, agent, which is why you need a small molecular size and it should not be toxic. So inulin is a gold standard, but it is difficult to use, expensive and time consuming, and it requires multiple urine sampling. Really problematic in children. So with technetium DTPA, we have an analog which is as close to inulin as you can get with a radio tracer, apart from chromium 51 EDTA, where you can't image. So technetium DTPA, you can get an image and you can get a GFR estimation. Now there are two ways of getting the GFR estimation. One is by the gamma camera method or the Gates method which is a simple procedure. It hardly takes 10 minutes. No blood sampling is required, but it's not very accurate, especially in children. It's adequate for a routine follow-up if you're following up the same patient over a span of one year, two years, three years, while giving some, say, nephrotoxic therapy or whatever, then it's good enough. For more accurate estimation, you need the plasma clearance method. There is no urine collection involved here, but you require plasma samples, maybe single sample, maybe two, maybe multiple samples, up to five samples over a span of three to four hours. This is an accurate estimate, but it's a little more cumbersome and it requires trained staff and very meticulous technique. 
So this is basically based on the bi-exponential clearance of technetium DTPA from the plasma. So by taking serial samples after initial injection, you can plot the disappearance of the uh, tracer from the blood. Initially, you'll have high concentration. And as the kidney filters it out, it goes out of the urine. So the plasma concentration of the tracer reduces over time. And you can either use this bi-exponential function for more complex calculations, or what we do in our institute, we take only the straight part of the curve. Some institutes only use a single sample. We use a three sample to avoid any error. So you can use what we use is 60, 90, and 120, uh, 60, uh, 120, and 180. That is one hour, two hour, and three hour samples. Or you could use data samples at 120, 180, and 300 minutes. Uh, protocol differs from center to center. So what you need is this, the slope of this curve to extrapolate to get the zero time activity. So that gives you the V. The V is the volume of dilution. Uh, that is the zero time activity divided by Y. That is the slope of the curve. The slope is obtained by this calculation 0 0.693 by T half. The T half is the time from zero time to where it reaches the half the activity. So anyhow, uh, this is a complex calculation. You also need to be very meticulous about the amount of activity that is being injected. At the end of which you get the GFR and you can normalize it to body surface area. What does this give you actually? If you compare it with the gamma camera method, now the gamma camera method is using a computer algorithm. The computer makes a rough estimation of the depth of the kidney, which is what can give rise to fallacies in children or extremely obese patients. We only do the same renal scintigraphy over 10 minutes and the computer calculates the GFR. Now in this particular patient, it says the GFR is 92.5. In the same patient, we have done a plasma clearance simultaneously not in a different setting, in the same setting, by taking plasma samples and by also doing the gamma camera method. Now, if you see, this is a 47-year-old uh, patient with an average height, average weight, 57 kg weight, 145 centimeters height. The GFR calculation by the plasma cl uh, clearance is 93.8, by the camera method is 92.5. The scale GFR is 108, by camera method 110 by plasma clearance. Almost identical, uh, with both. So not very much of a difference, which is why I said you can use the Gates GFR, that is the camera method GFR for all routine estimations in average built adult patients. In children, it will give you a fallacy. In grossly obese patients, it will give you a fallacy. And once in a while, even in adults, depending on whether the patient preparation and all that has been accurate or not, it can give you false methods. So it's good for follow-up, but if you want a really accurate and a guaranteed accurate method, use the plasma clearance method. Briefly on the role of evaluation of hypertension. So you have hypertension for, by, by renal causes can be renovascular hypertension, or you may have a pheochromocytoma, or you may have a renal scar. So how does nuclear medicine help in these? Gold standard for RAS is obviously renal arteriography, where so you can demonstrate the narrow renal artery which is invasive and costly. The main thing is it does not differentiate hemodynamically significant obstruction from just incidental presence of renal artery stenosis. In other words, it does not establish whether the stenosis which is present in the artery is functionally significant or not. So for which we have captopril renography. <clears throat> now captopril renography is dependent on the function of the renin-angiotensin system. I won't go into the details. You all know how the renin-angiotensin system works. Captopril is an ACE inhibitor. It blocks the hyperproduction of angiotensin II. Now, how does that work? It reduces the post-glomerular arteriolar pressure, causing a fall in glomerular filtration, which reduces the function of the affected kidney. If the renal function is normal to begin with, this is a 90% sensitive and specific investigation, but it falls dramatically once the renal function goes down. So how do we do it? We use uh, captopril in a dose of 50 milligram orally or 0.7 milligram per kg in younger patients and children. This is administered about one hour before the study. You have to monitor the BP carefully every 15 minutes after administration. 
You have to ensure that ACE inhibitors are stopped at least five days prior to the study, and no antihypertensive drugs are given on the day of the study. You need a one baseline study and one post-captopril study. Diagrammatic representation of how it works. So this is the normal circumstance where you have the system working smoothly. In a, an afferent arteriolar stenosis, the angiotensin II kicks in through the renin angiotensin system, causing vasoconstriction. So the efferent arterial uh, also narrows down under the action of angiotensin II to maintain the GFR. The GFR is maintained in this condition. What do we do? We give an ACE inhibitor. ACE inhibitor dilates the uh, blocks the angiotensin II, dilates the efferent arteriole. The afferent arteriole is still constricted because of the stenosis. As a result, the filtration pressure drops, so the GFR is reduced. What happens to the renogram? This is the baseline study without intervention. The moment you've given the ACE inhibitor, the unaffected kidney continues to show a normal renogram. The affected kidney shows a rising renogram curve pattern. So you have different types of renogram curves, again, with the ACE inhibitor effects as with the uh, obstruction. So Type 0 is normal, type 1 is minor abnormalities, with the Tmax increasing and the graph shifting to the right, delayed peak, delayed clearance. 2 and 3 show gradually deteriorating excretion and gradually flattening curves. There is no longer a peak, there is no longer a clearance T-half, and type 5 is renal failure pattern. Here you can't measure anything. So. The diagnostic criteria being a change in the 20 minute peak to peak uptake ratio, prolonged transit time, delay in excretion of tracer into the renal pelvis, increase in Tmax, and more than 10% drop in relative renal function, which you, here you can see the, from the normal renogram curve, you're getting gradually delayed peak. From a normal clearance T half, you're getting a flattened clearance, so no T half, and a drop in the percentage function from this peak to this peak. How does it work on the uh, images? This is a single kidney patient, precious kidney, no left kidney functioning. Right kidney, this is the baseline study where you see already there is a deterioration in function. Renal artery stenosis can do that. Even in the baseline, you can get a delayed function, a delayed peak, uh, badly affected clearance TF is not very good. But once you give captopril, you end up with a rising curve pattern, no peak, no clearance whatsoever there is a cortical retention, nothing coming out into the bladder. Uh, please remember in single kidney patients, you have this risk of causing a transient renal shutdown. It's reversible with time. It'll come back once the effect of the captopril is one, but it's a risky procedure anyway. This is a very old study because I could, uh, we hardly do this study anymore. Captopril is no longer available readily. I don't remember in the last few years having done any of these captopril renography studies. So this is from an ancient archive in 1999. Bilateral renal artery stenosis suspected. The top line shows the baseline study where you can see the two kidneys and you can see the two renal renogram curves. Post captopril, both the curves have flattened out and all you can see is background activity. The estimated GFR dropping from initial 12 and 31 the baseline study to 5 and 17 post captopril. So alternatives, if you can't find captopril, you can use enalapril or losartan or even aspirin has been used. Aspirin works by inhibition of prostaglandin synthesis. It has no hypotensive effect. So ACE inhibitors need not be stopped here. There is a delay in the renogram peak as a diagnostic criteria. There have been some studies, but the last ones were done 20 years back. So I don't think anyone is using these anymore. Briefly, the PET Tracers can also be used, but only in research settings. This is a healthy subject, and this is in renal insufficiency. This is a patient with a left-sided renal artery stenosis. You can see that the uptake is much less than on the right side. Similarly, C11 compounds have also been used. Not very important to remember. Now, MIBG imaging is what we use for diagnosis of pheochromocytoma. MIBG is a norepinephrine analog. It works in the same way. It's uh, the uh, reuptake mechanism follows the same as the uptake mechanism for norepinephrine. So in patients with a FIO, you have, this is a typical, some, uh, some of our consultants, when they have 
a doubt, especially when you have an ultrasound proven adrenal mass. Concentration of MIBG in the uh, left adrenal in a patient with a mass seen on the CECT. So this proves that there is a left adrenal pheochromocytoma. This is a, again another patient. I won't spend too much time on this. This is just a neuroendocrine tumor in a retroperitoneal mass. This is a right paraiotic lesion. So it's a neuroendocrine tumor, not necessarily a pheo. This is a paraganglioma most likely. And metastatic pheo also, you can use the MIBG scan. Uh, this is usually used for confirmation once a diagnosis is suspected after the standard biochemical tests. The newer tracer, because MIBG, I-131 MIBG is not easily available and you can see the scan quality is not very good. Now we have the PET tracer that is gallium 68 dota knock or dota tate, which we use. So here you have a um, right adrenal mass, which shows high pickup with the gallium dota tate. This is the dota, dota knock uptake in the adrenal mass. So finally, moving on to renal cortical imaging. Uh, I'll be overshooting the time a little as this is quite a long talk. Now, DMS, this was the third tracer that I spoke about right in the beginning. So, I've already told you about this cortical binding in the proximal convoluted tubule, one to five milligram injected intravenously, and static images are taken after. Here, there is no dynamic scintigraphy. You straight away go and take a single image after three hours. So, you can take anterior, posterior, and oblique images. The pinhole collimator is something which only, I think, PGA Chandigarh has one or two other centers may have it. This gives you extra magnified images. I'll just demonstrate what it looks like. So the applications of DMS, DMSA scintigraphy, you can evaluate relative size, shape, position, and function of the kidney. Mainly, we use it for evaluation of scars in cortical pyelonephritis and in detection of infarcts. The functional cortical mass can be determined, especially following blunt trauma, uh, either in, as in contact sports or the road traffic accidents, to identify functioning part of the polycystic or multicystic kidneys, and in the evaluation of anatomical or congenital anomalies like renal agenesis, ectopia, renal fusion, duplex, and horseshoe kidneys. What does it look like? Now here, as I said, you have a single static image. This is a normal DMSA scan. Anterior image, posterior image. As you can see, hardly any background seen in the posterior image. No, very little bladder activity because the image has been acquired after emptying out the bladder. These are the pinhole images. Now, the pinhole collimator is something we attach to the gamma camera. It works on the same principle as a pinhole camera. As you can see, it gives you an enlarged, magnified image with great detail. The cortical outline is very elegantly demonstrated. So even the smallest defects can be very clearly identified. This is a patient with a scarred left kidney. Now you can see the upper pole, there is a defect here and the lower pole, the cortical outline has been indented. The right kidney is normal. This is the same patient eight months later, no intervention done. Now as you can see, now even the right kidney upper pole has developed a defect. The left kidney is almost disappeared. There is hint of a palated ureter here, which gives you a hint about what the cause is, most likely reflux nephropathy. 18 months after the first scan, now the right kidney has also developed upper and lower polar defects, left kidney having disappeared. This is all refluxed activity in the kidney. So following up the same patient over a span of 18 months, the right initially the left kidney had bipolar defects, which led to a disappeared kidney or complete obliteration of renal function. Right kidney initially was okay. Later on developed first an upper polar and then a bipolar scar. Hydronephrotic kidneys, there can be a problem. Hydronephrotic and multicystic kidneys distinguishing these from scarred kidneys because again, the kidney function is compromised. The kidney cortex is thinned out. Generally, these will show a maintained outline. The outer outline will be maintained in a hydronephrotic kidney. It is the dilated system which causes thinning of the cortex. But if you have defects in the cortex like this, it's difficult to say whether this is a scarring in addition to the hydronephrosis. Polycystic or multicystic kidneys, again, you have multiple defects in the cortex. This is a kidney with bilateral multiple cortical cysts. They look the same as the scars. You have defects in the cortical outline. 
in a blunt trauma abdomen like in these patients you can see uh there is loss of cortical mass in the left kidney here later on in this kidney the kid end out so you can use the dmsa to identify a uh, functional mass or a deterioration in the functional mass where how much of a role does fdg pet ct have in renal function evaluation uh if you can afford it and if the patient can afford it and if you have the uh, facility available now this is an fdg pet ct in a patient this is a classical normal renal cyst cortical cyst that we routinely come across so non infected cyst there is no uptake but because the fdg is cleared out through the kidneys you find a little bit of fdg present in the collecting system whereas an infected cyst this is a multiple uh it's a polycystic kidney with multiple infections in the cyst so very high fdg uptake you can use the fdg pet ct to identify specifically the cortical cyst uh, renal cortical cyst infection another role which is more commonly used that is primary rcc whether there is metastasis so here you can see there is metastasis to the mediastinal lymph nodes the right hilo and brain as well vur now vesica ureteric reflux either you can do an indirect radionuclide cystography ureterography or a direct uh cyst ureterography how do they differ the ircg is usually done as a dynamic study following a dtp or an ec renography you wait for the study to finish this is dependent on both kidneys draining out all their activity into the bladder like you saw right in the first scan that i showed you there is no residual tracer in the kidney or the bladder if the there is no obstruction to the renal function and the renal function is well maintained so what you have to do is at the end of the study you position the patient in front of the gamma camera and ask the patient to wide and if there is activity going up into the ureter that is a reflux now the problem here is if there is any residual activity left behind in the ureter it's difficult to determine whether it is activity coming down from the kidney or is activity going up from the bladder for which purpose the drcg is a more sensitive uh, method now what happens here is there is no iv injection involved we inject the tracer supra pubically into the full bladder yes it is invasive but it is very very sensitive so this is how it is done you wait you hydrate the patient ask the patient to drink water cold drinks tea coffee whatever palpate the bladder till you can palpate in a thin built patient it shouldn't be a problem in children it's hardly ever a problem so once you palpate the bladder you can inject using a 1 and 1/2 inch needle routine syringe and needle so you go supra pubically withdraw into the syringe to see once you see urine coming into the syringe you push the tracer into the full bladder the tracer in this case can be any non absorbable tracer technetium sulfocolloid technetium ma technetium mdp anything but technetium dtp or ec because those tend to get absorbed and then you'll have a problem visualizing the kidneys so you inject it into the full bladder and you ask the patient to stand in front of the gamma camera back to the camera and wide into a container so this is what you will see there is no interference with tracer coming down from the kidney so you have the full bladder and you see this reflux activity again it's posterior imaging so left is left right is right this is a left sided vu reflux the bladder empties out all your left is with reflux activity in the left ureter and the left renal system this is the pre void image this is the post void image so post void you can see it's a high grade reflux into the renal pelvis this is again similarly a bilateral vesico ureteric reflux right from the first from the pre void image itself you have seen the reflux into both the ureters throughout the study some other uses of the renal scintigraphy this is post pcn a patient developed uh, what was thought to be a pleural effusion uh, but they suspected that there was a puncture of the pleura so we did a routine renal scintigraphy only positioning the patient with the chest in view this was a small child so as you can see the tracer coming into the kidneys and then halfway through the study you see the tracer accumulating above the right kidney superior to the right kidney which continues here you can also see tracer coming out of the kidney so delayed images elegantly displaying that the there is a communication from the kidney into the 
pleural space. So, urinothorax demonstrated on renal scintigraphy. If the kidney function is very poor, you know, this is what you will get. You won't see any kidney. All you'll see is background activity. Now, how poor is poor? It differs for the traces. Technetium EC is highly resistant, so you can go ahead and do a scan up to a creatinine of 4 or even 5 sometimes. You'll still see kidney. DMSA above a creatinine value of 3, there is no point. This is what you will see. This is a DMSA scan in a patient with a creatinine of 3.5 or 4. So, kidney will not be seen. The tracer will not be uh, absorbed or cleared through the kidney system. DTPA is the worst. Above a creatinine of 2, there is hardly any point in trying a DTPA scan. So, please, it's essential to get a creat value if you're suspecting a deteriorated renal function. Now, as I said earlier, the importance of taking a history for contrast uh, administration. This is a patient where a DMS scan was done immediately on the day following a contrast study, contrast IVP. So as you can see, high background activity, this would be mistaken for a, an impaired renal cortical function. But when you do the DTPA scan, after seven days, you see a pretty good renal function with a normal renogram curve. So that's the time it has taken for the contrast to uh, clear out from the system. So please remember if the, to take a history of iodinated contrast and give at least seven days after a um, IVP and about 14 days after a CCT. Contrast CT has a very high level of iodine. So this is what a horseshoe kidney looks like on a DMS scan. This is the IVP, anterior image. So right kidney still visualized, left not seen. This is the DMS scan, anterior more or less mimicking the right uh, the IVP posterior image showing there is a faint uptake in the kidney and you can see the isthmus function as well. Horseshoes come in a variety of shapes and sizes. So DMSA can demonstrate that very nicely. Ectopic low-lying kidneys, again, one of the first and one of the indications as I said was for locating ectopic kidneys and quantitating their function. Also, you can have a variety of fused kidneys, pancake kidneys, ectopic kidneys, cross-fused kidneys, all identified on the DMSS scan. Uh, finally, renal transplant evaluation. So you can determine again the same parameters as what we use for renal function, the perfusion, function, drainage, acute transplant rejection, ATN, urine leaks and peritransplant collections. I'll quickly run through these. We're already beyond time. So EC renography in a normal renal transplant here it is anterior projection because the transplant is placed anteriorly. So here you have uptake in the right iliac fossa and the very good perfusion. Again, the same perfusion phase. Within two seconds of the iliac vessel, you can see perfusion in the transplant kidney. Good transplant perfusion, good cortical function. You can see the bladder by four to five minutes. The renogram curve will not be as good as in the normal native kidneys, but you will still get a similar shape. Don't mistake this for a abnormal or delayed uh, peak. So this is normal transplant function with an obstructed drainage into the bladder. Acute rejection, what happens is the perfusion goes and obviously the function also goes. So here you can see the perfusion, perfusion, the kidney appears quite late and there's a high background and poor function. So this is a transplant, acute transplant rejection. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't get any images from our own archives because we hardly get any of these patients referred to us nowadays. The nephrologists have become expert at doing a biopsy in the ward itself. They get the report immediately. So the at one time we used to do at least half a dozen of these patients every week. Almost on a daily basis, we would get some uh, patient of transplant or the other acute transplant tonic uh, rejection uh, whatever. But uh, nowadays, we hardly see these patients once or twice a month in our setup. So ATN, the perfusion is well maintained. As you can see, the perfusion phase, excellent perfusion. But the background is high and the clearance, the uptake and the clearance is delayed. So if the perfusion is maintained, this is acute tubular necrosis. Non-viable graft, all you see is perfusion in the vessels, nothing in the kidney. So this is a gone case kidney. Now quantification of the perfusion can also be done. This was the uh, Hilson's perfusion index. 
which was earlier followed. Um, you can draw time activity curve for the aorta. So this is or the iliac artery. So this is the iliac artery curve. This is the renal curve. So you take the ratio of the um, aortic curve uh, or the iliac curve divided by the area under the curve for the kidney. So the normal ratio should be more than, uh, sorry, this is uh, the acute rejection. Both are shown as normal uh, ratio should be less than 150 in acute rejection. The ratio becomes more than 150. Obviously, as the renal curve falls in rejection, the curve flattens out. So this area becomes very small in compared to the uh, vessel curve. So naturally, this region divided by this region, the ratio will go up very high. I'm sorry, this should have been less than 150. So post-transplant perinephric fluid collection, finally. Urinoma versus the others, lymphocele, hematoma, or abscess. What we're looking for is whether there is a perinephric collection of fluid, which is radioactive. So if there is urine leak from the kidney, you will get something like this. Initially, a photopenic defect during the dynamic curve, which later on shows accumulation of tracer. So this is urine leaking out into the perinephric region. As compared to, uh, so this, you can also use SPECT-CT, that is a hybrid imaging, to get an anatomical delineation of what is the size and exactly where is this leak located. In a lymphocele, there will be a photopenic defect with a very, very, either no uptake of tracer or a very much delayed and a very slow, at 24 hours, you'll see some collection, not as much as in a urinoma. So again, using uh, hybrid spect CT imaging, you can see that there is, this is the kidney and this is the uh, lymphocele without any collection of tracer. For those patients who are on dialysis, especially peritoneal dialysis, this is one investigation which might help. That is, often you see a, a patent uh, pathway, tunica vaginalis, that is the tracer, which is especially under the high pressure activity when you're filling up the tracer for the peritoneal dialysis, filling up the dialysis fluid in the peritoneal cavity. The patient ends up with what looks like a hydrocele. So if you just inject the tracer, that is technetium sulfur colloid usually in these cases, you can actually see that the tracer first fills up and then it follows the pathway into the scrotal sac. So this demonstrates that there is a patent tunica vaginalis. You can repair this uh, before proceeding with future peritoneal dialysis procedures. This may be unilateral or bilateral as well. So thank you for your attention. I've gone considerably over the time, but uh, any kind of questions, I'll be happy to uh, take. So any questions, anyone, any doubts, anything? Okay, we've got a question in the chat box. How much gap should be there between two nucleus kinds, DTP and DMSA? Good question. That's based on the, I think the IVP thing that I said. Uh, I, a safe gap is 48 hours. See the technetium 99M uh, tracer that we are using has a six hour half-life. So generally by 24 hours, it should be all cleared out. But once in a while, if there's an obstructed kidney with a DTPS scan, you might get a holdup. Even with a DMSA scan, 
because the DMS is only 40% retained and 60% cleared out. So till 24 hours, there might be some leftover activity in the kidney, which can cause, especially, you know, if it's an obstructed kidney on one side and a normal kidney on the other side, you do the other scan the next day, the, that residual activity might interfere. So in an emergency, and especially if both kidneys are completely draining off and you've done the DTPA scan first and the DMSA scan second, you can do it on the following day, 24 hours apart. Otherwise, 48 hours is an absolutely safe limit. We generally follow this dictum, uh, one day gap between the two scans. If you do the DTP on a Monday, you do the DMS on a Wednesday or vice versa. So 48 hours apart is a safe limit. Peri transplant collection, use DTP or use EC, either of them. Don't use DMS. DMS is not going to give you any information on a peri transplant collection. You, what you need is a dynamic renal scintigraphy here. So technetium EC, if you have it, that's the best. If you don't have technetium EC, you've got DTPA, use DTPA, it'll give you the information. Provided, of course, that the serum creatinine is within the limits, as I said. If you're going to use DTPA, make sure the creatinine is below 2, 2.2 maximum. With EC, you can go to a higher creatinine value of 3, 3.5, 4 or so. Any preparation needed for DTPS scan for GFR estimation? Okay, same preparation as I outlined in the beginning. Patient needs to be well hydrated, absolutely essential. If you do not hydrate the patient properly, you will get erroneous results. Make sure that the patient does not had a contrast study in the immediate uh, week, as I said, time gaps. If the patient has had an IVP, give it seven to 10 days gap, at least seven days, preferably 10 days. If the patient has had a contrast CT study, then make sure that there is a gap of at least two weeks, preferably three. So, uh, good hydration. Good hydration would mean at least one liter of water uh, taken prior to the injection of the tracer in an adult. In children, 500 to 600 ml minimum. Uh, diuretic administration is not really required here because you're doing a GFR estimation. Patient can void as and when they feel like it. No other preparation, the patient can have the normal meals. Nothing uh, that the patient eats will interfere. But only thing is, make sure there is no contrast, radiological iodinated contrast injected prior to the uh, study and patient has to be well hydrated. That's absolutely essential. Patient can continue to eat and drink even during the study. If you're doing a GFR estimation by plasma clearance over three, four, five hours, patient can continue to eat and drink normally. The preference would be to give more fluids. It's not just water, juice, tea, coffee, whatever. And patient can have their meals as well. Importance of DTPA scan in acute pyelonephritis. Apart from identifying renal function, not much. Pyelonephritis, we prefer the DMSA scan. Here you're looking for cortical uh, scarring versus pyelonephritis. So the DTPA scan will, uh, since it's a dynamic renal scintigraphy and the tracer is kind of passing through the cortex. So you won't get very much information on the renal cortex. The second thing is the dynamic scan, as you saw, is taken on a smaller matrix size. You get smaller images. So it's difficult to identify any kind of a cortical defect. The DMSA scan concentrates on the cortex, remains behind in the cortex. You're taking a single image at three hours. You're taking larger matrix sizes. The size of the scan is, uh, the uh, image is larger. And if you use a pinhole, then you will get even better resolution of the cortical margins. So pyelonephritis is best identified on DMSA scan, not on DTPA scan. If you ask me, should a DTPA scan be done? Not of much use. 
you can get the cortical percentage function from the DMS scan also. The only exception to this is when you have obstructed hydronephrosis with pyelonephritis, the DMS scan will give you an erroneous percentage function because of the holdup of the tracer because of the obstruction. So there I would prefer using a DTPA scan for the percentage function evaluation. That is done in the first three to five minutes of the DTPA scan where the obstruction will not interfere, you'll get the uh, percentage function. Apart from that, the DDP scan has no role in acute pyelonephritis. Could I discuss the inulin scan for academic interest? Uh, no, I couldn't. I have personally never done an inulin scan in my 30 years in nuclear medicine. I don't know how it's done. I have never seen it done uh, either, either in my residency time in Ames or subsequent in PGI. I have absolutely no idea of how an inulin scan is done. Please, I would prefer you looked it up in the literature somewhere. I okay. Think, uh, Any other side. questions? Yeah. Uh -huh. One more has popped up. What is the sensitivity of technetium system AB scan to detect parathyroid adenoma? Okay, that's an ectopic question. Nothing to do directly with the renal scan, but since you have asked, the system AB scan has uh, an 85 to 90 percent sensitivity for picking up parathyroid adenomas. That's what the literature says. That's what we have found in our uh, department also. It depends on a few other factors like uh, the size of the adenoma, the functionality, um, small adenomas may be missed, um, but otherwise it's a very good investigation. Okay, any more questions? If there are no other questions, then we can wind up. Uh, one more has come. Any subjective variation in reporting of DTPA? Excellent question. Yes, there is. There can be quite a lot of subjective variation depending on the experience of the person reporting the scan. Now, uh, I wouldn't say that it's uh, going to make very much of a difference in the routine reporting. Uh, experience would mean 500 scans at least. So for anybody who has had a reasonable experience, that is 500 scans see in our department, and I think also at Ames, we do an average of 15 to 20 scans a day. So that would be you know reaching that number in a very quick time. So even the residents become expert in reporting within a matter of six months or so. The problem comes in where there are variations, subtle variations, uh, especially in the entity known as partial PUGO. Now this is a constant source of friction between the urologist, nephrologist and nuclear medicine people. What is partial PUGO? What does a surgeon do? Does he do a partial surgery? Uh, what does a nephrologist do? Does he treat or not treat or keep the patient under observation? So this is where the experience factor comes in. Also, sometimes a single scan may not do the job. You may need uh, multiple scans over a period of time, say six months apart or one year apart. You will need to co correlate the uh, scan with other investigations like ultrasound or maybe IVP 
or maybe even MR urography to actually get a final opinion. The variation can be, as I showed you on the percentage function, depending on who has drawn the region of interest over which part of the kidney, whole kidney ROI versus cortical ROI, DTPA versus EC, the preparation of the patient in so far as whether the patient has been hydrated well or not. Inadequate hydration can play havoc with your uh, scan. If you have not detected it, if somebody has been careless in hydrating the patient or the patient has uh, you know, said that, yes, I've taken fluid, but actually has not. So all these factors need to be identified when reporting a scan, and that is where the expertise of the uh, nuclear medicine physician comes into play. Apart from that, in a standard run-of-the-mill situation, patient has been hydrated properly. There has been no extravasation of the tracer. That is one thing which I forgot to mention. Instead of going IV, even if a little bit of the tracer extravasates, then that is going to cause a flattening of the renogram curve. So that needs to be detected also. We usually do it by taking an image, routinely taking an image of the injection site to detect any extravasated activity. So these are pitfalls in the scan. You will find the uh, whole articles on the pitfalls of renography in the literature. Apart from that, there should not be any variation. Uh, GFR calculation can vary with two different observers. Not much. If you have done a gate study, if you have drawn the ROIs properly, the computer is doing the calculation, it will be the same whichever way, whoever does it. If you're doing a plasma clearance, if you have uh, followed the protocol, measured the activity properly, the injected activity properly, uh, measured out your plasma samples properly, then again, there should not be any variation between two observers. The GFR calculation is a numerical calculation. It should not vary. As I said, provided if you're doing a Gates method and you've drawn ROIs, the ROI should be drawn accurately. If that is done, then different observers will get the same value, plus minus maybe one or two ML, that's all. In fact, we have seen that in patients with routine follow-up, if a Gates method is used over a span of many years, the GFR uh, calculation remains exactly the same, plus minus maybe one or two ML, um, which is why it is used it's a good investigation for following of the same patient over a long span of time. So, okay, any other questions? None, so it's beyond eight o'clock. Can we finally close, wind up? Okay, sir. On behalf of the students, sir, thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank if you, sir. Any other queries, I'll be glad to answer them in a separate session if you can collect the queries and surely, sir. Surely. Please don't hesitate to call. Right. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, sir. You. Our pleasure, sir. Thank you. Yeah.